grandchildren. Yes, grandchildren are great. Y'all know them very well. <laughs> and uh, Stacy informed us when we were getting in that, well, guess what? A couple of the grandboys are going to come spend the night with you. I said, okay, well, that is good. <laughs> You know, I go to bed about 8 or 8.30 every night, and uh, we didn't get in until about midnight last night, which is you know, 1 o'clock my time, so if I appear to be cranky, that's, that's probably why. <laughs> but we're glad to be here. We're glad to see our grandsons. We're glad to see our family and glad to see y'all. A good crowd for this morning. We appreciate that. I was, as Brother Perry was teaching, and he said, you know, turn to this passage, get one hand, and in this hand, get this, and then in this hand, in the third hand, get that. <laughs> You know, we've been in right division for a long time listening to that, and there is absolutely proof positive that evolution does not work. Because after 30-something years, somebody would have that third hand. <laughs> and, uh, and none of us do, so, uh, so we do that. So praise the Lord for that. Well, if you will get your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And we'll read verses 9 to 14. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 to 14. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, and whom also after ye trusted, uh, that ye heard the word of the truth of the gospel uh, of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that we do have a book. We're so thankful that we have a message that just is something that we just simply have to receive and believe and, of course, by faith. All about what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished for us at Calvary. We pray today as we study that he'll be lifted up, he'll be honored, and he'll be the one that's glorified. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, verse 13 says, In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed. You know, believing is something that uh, we just, uh, we do, I would say, just sometimes taking God's word at it, using the good common sense that God gave us, and we say, yes, we believe that. But not because some man comes up and says something about it, but because this is, in fact, the word of God and something that we can take and hold to be, be true in, a, in our life. You know, this, there's been, um, this, and believing is a theme that has been consistent, if you will, in Paul's message. He says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, he says, when he says, uh, Romans chapter 1 and 16. Yeah, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I'm glad that it's an everyone message. It's an everyone message which is based on whether you believe it or not. It's not an everyone message based on, uh, on any other doctrine or any other principle, but it's do you believe the gospel. Today when Paul talks about the gospel of Christ, he's talking about that special revelation that was committed to him about what was com com accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ at, uh, at Calvary. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, he says. Why? Because it's the power of God unto salvation. When he's talking about salvation here, of course he's talking about uh, justification unto eternal life. But the Pauline revelation about all that was accomplished by Christ at Calvary is the power of God unto salvation. It can deliver us from all sorts of harm and evil. It can set us on a path which is straight, a path which we understand and can, uh, can apply the details to our lives. And uh, I think that's good news. All around good news. But it's the power of God unto salvation. And what do you have to do? You can't work for it. You can't pay for it. It's just something that you believe. Believe it or not. And they're, of course, not believing it has consequences. Come with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 and verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that 
believe, for there is no difference. It's unto all. Now, isn't the finished work of Christ at Calvary great? It's to everyone that believeth. It's unto all. There's that qualification, though. Unto all and upon all them that believe. There's not one person alive today that the Lord Jesus Christ, a, a finished work of Christ at Calvary, is not available to them. It's unto all. You know, wouldn't it be something if every time we went to share the gospel with somebody, we had to wonder, are they one of the ones? Can they hear? Can they believe? Or is God going to restrict them from believing? But it's unto all. But it's specifically the good news is going to be applied to their account if they believe, if they trust. In other words, as Ephesians 1 would have us go on. You know, and the truth is, the only difference about of, uh, which matters where someone is going to spend eternity is what do they believe about the Lord Jesus Christ? And it's going to come down to what, what do they believe about the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it what God believes about his son, the Lord Jesus Christ? It's his opinion that's going to count, and he's going to reveal to us in his word what that's about. Heaven and eternal life is a gift. It's a, it's a gift. You know, we had a gentleman in our church uh, not too long ago who was giving a testimony about someone he'd been witnessing to for a long time and, and a family, and their daughter came in on one time, and, you know, uh, he said it was kind of odd and strange, but she really didn't have a concept of, what, concept of what a gift was. I said, how can somebody know, not know what a gift is? Well, you know, when somebody, all the advertising we get today and we talk about something that's free, you know, if you buy one, it's free. Just pay shipping and handling. Well, that's not free, is it? <laughs> that's, you know, it's plus shipping and handling. And I tell you what, that adds up after a while. But perhaps it's the, that type of attitude and a, a lack of awareness that we have. But a gift is something given with nothing uh, expected in return. It's just given. And God says, if you will believe, that Christ down the cross for your sins, I will give you eternal life. That's the best life that we can have, eternal life. You know, and eternal life is something that's been a gift from God. And it's something that's been available to all men of all ages. Now, the specific message about Christ at Calvary is not, but from Adam on, uh, all men have been justified by faith. It was just faith in what God had revealed to them. When Moses walked out to Melch and when uh, Abraham walked out to Melchizedek, and he acknowledged that uh, that uh, Melchizedek's God was the the God of and Creator of the heaven and the earth, you know that was about all that was available to them at the time. Witnessed, of course, by creation, and Abraham could go out there and he could confirm that that was what he said. He said, "I confirm to you, this is what I believe too." Well, that was what what Abraham had to believe, and it's always been the issue of faith. Do you know how many people have ever worked their way to heaven, worked their way to e eternal life? None. Nobody. Nobody's ever done that at all. And the reason that no one believed in the finished work of Christ at Calvary because no one in time past until this message was revealed to the Apostle Paul, they didn't know anything about it. And so it became, uh, as this message was committed to Paul, the gospel of the grace of God was committed to Paul. This is what, uh, come to 1 Timothy chapter 2. It became that Paul became what is known as the Due time testifier. Now, sometimes I can get real hard on people, and I can say, how come they can't see this? And uh, why don't they just pay attention to the words? Well, you know, I was a long, hard time coming. I came kicking and screaming, and it took a long time for me to be able to see this. But here's a verse. If we just look at what the verse says, we would know that something uniquely was given to the Apostle Paul that was never given to anybody else. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. It says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. To be testified when the time was right. And, and, he, says that, and he says in verse, uh, uh, in verse 3, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And there's a very unique dispensational point that the Apostle Paul is going to make, which is absolutely a clarifying thing. It's like putting a magnifying glass on what the Apostle Paul's message was about. He says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 
one mediator. You know, up until in time past, there was the whole nation was a mediator, the whole nation of Israel. It says they were to be the ones that were to be the go between between God and men. But he says, listen, times have changed. I am the due time testifier. It is given to me to come and to tell you that there is only one mediator between God and men. And that is great news. It's great news for us today because we don't have to go hunt anybody down, nor do they have to hunt us down. Because what we can do is we can come to God's word by faith and believe it and recognize that our way to, to, uh, to having a right relationship with God is through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. That all I do believe is, as we learn, is that it's, it was the way that everybody had been justified in time past. But now, out there in the ages to come, whether or not that's their message or not, that's God's way that he is going to justify mankind, if you will. You know, so he comes along, and it's part of Paul's message that he's to testify about the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is that message? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Come to 1 Corinthians 15. Verses 3 and 4. 1 Corinthians 15 Verse 3 and 4, Paul says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. And who did he receive it from? The risen and glorified Lord Jesus Christ. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Now, the truth is that you can find the death of Christ in the Old Testament. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. What you can't find, though, is how it's uniquely applied to us today in the dispensation of grace. So he says how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And this gospel, he says, about how Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, he is going to give it a name. Come to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And verse 24. Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and, uh, and, uh, and the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God. You know, our Bibles could have perhaps taken on a whole different meaning and understanding if it just said just to testify the gospel. So the Perry talking about the gospel, the glad tidings. You know, Peter had a gospel. Noah had a gospel. It was good news to him. And if he just built that ark and get on it, he wasn't going to drown. And so there's good news all throughout the Bible. And it wasn't the kingdom gospel, how that, uh, that, the, uh, how that Christ was on, the, on this earth, walking on the face of this earth, ready to offer them the kingdom. But, you know, we come and we say, well, now, now we've got something we can isolate. We've got something that we can study. The gospel which was committed to the Apostle Paul, he says, which is the gospel of the grace of God. You know, if, if, every, if everybody was named Jim Smith, I know there are a lot of people are, but if everybody was named Jim Smith, we wouldn't know who we're talking about, would we? And we'd say, is he talking about me? <laughs> no, I was talking about Jim, you know. But, uh, but the, the name and the title is what clarifies uh, what the content was going to and should be. The message that Paul received from the Lord is called the gospel of the grace of God. And this gospel is the good news of how God is going to solve man's biggest problem. You know what our biggest problem is? It's not health. It's not wealth. It's not prosperity. We've got one really big problem. Come to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know what man's biggest problem is? They come short of the glory of God. And what is God's glory a manifestation of? It's going to be his righteousness. It's going to be the righteousness of God. And man, no matter what he thinks, all men, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know how many sins it would take to come short of the glory of God? One. One. I thought we were going to sing, hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to make it mine. 
I mean, boy, there are a lot of fingers that went up. But it, it's just one. I'm afraid I'm guilty of more. In fact, we're under the penalty of two sins. One of the sins we commit, the one being born in sin. And so we all come short of the glory of God. How are we going to remedy that? Verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Being justified freely. Now, what is freely? Anything that comes up and they say freely to you, it is a gift. It is in exchange for what? Well, today it's in exchange for believing what God says about His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we come along, we see this. And, and so uh, in failing to remedy the fact of coming short of the glory of God, there are consequences. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 says... Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. How many people think that the wages of sin is tithing or not tithing? How many think the wages of sin is not giving your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ? How many think that the wages of sin is, is you're going to pay the penalty of sin if you don't make him Lord of your life? You know what the wages of sin is? It's death. And the death is talking about here is not physical death. The death that's being talked about here is being eternally separated from God, cast alive into the lake of fire to burn there for eternity, to be tormented for eternity. The wages of sin is death, but, oh boy, I'm glad for that. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Not through me, not through my works, not through my good intentions, it's through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the central figure of all that God was free to do to remedy the problem that man had of coming short of his glory. His whole plan of redemption hinges on that which comes through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Come to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5, we'll begin in verse 18 and go to the end, through 21. Second Corinthians 5, verse 18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. Now, how can we be? For he, that's God, hath made him, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be sin for us. And Christ didn't know any sin. Who knew no sin? For this purpose, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. If we're going to be, if, if our issue of sin and coming short of the glory of God has a remedy. It is that God makes us righteous. And when we stand before someone today and we say, be ye reconciled to God, of course, that precludes that we've shared the gospel with them. There's only one way to be reconciled to God. That is believing that Christ died for your sins and my sins. He died for us. Be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us. Had to make him to be sin. But he did that for our benefit, to remedy the one thing that we had no ability to remedy on our own, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, the reason why Paul's message is such good news is God has provided an absolute foolproof, works 1,000% of the time to remedy our problem. He placed that burden on his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what happened? He made him to be sin for us. You know what the Lord Jesus Christ did when he was at Calvary? He suffered the penalty of sin. He died. But you know what? He, you know, some people say, well, when he died, he went to the lower parts of the earth. That must mean he went to the lake of fire. No. The only people to go to the lake of fire are those who don't have their sins forgiven. But what he did was paying the price of sin, satisfied 
the offended righteousness of God, completely paid the debt, and he paid the debt for me, and he paid the debt for you. You know, I was looking, uh, and I was hoping that when we got here today that the sign that we normally have here would say, Christ died for our sins. I thought, okay, this would be great because I can point to that and everybody can go, amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Christ died for our sins. I can see the red light on the television camera crew flashing and everybody saying, praise the Lord, Christ died for our sins. We're just going to have to pretend that that sign's there. That's the closest to getting the Holy Ghost I think I've ever had. You know, my my knees was trembling. I was feeling, I got hair standing up on the back of my neck. I don't know what it means if it doesn't mean that. But you know, the good news, that is good news, isn't it? And it's the, the best news. It, it can't be good news today and then three days from now I find out that there's been a rescind order on that. It is just absolutely good news. But verse 19, it says, To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses, trespasses unto them, and hath given unto us the word of reconciliation. You know, the furthest thing from God's mind when Christ is at Calvary, God was in Christ to wit. Know this, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto them, himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. He didn't need to. We were guilty already. He didn't have to prove anything like that. We, we were absolutely condemned. But what we did need to know was, was there going to be a way of redemption? Was there going to be a recon, way of reconciliation? And he said, there absolutely was. And I'm going to make everyone who has trusted Christ as their Savior, I'm giving them this special position and privilege of being an ambassador. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As, go, God, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray, we beg, we beseech. We get down on our hands and knees and we plead, we pray you, be ye reconciled to God. Because we understand what happens to those that don't, that are not reconciled to God. You know, we come along, we see that this is, a, this is a gift, a gift he gives us, a gift of righteousness, all that's accomplished by Christ. Come with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And, and we ask ourselves, it's asked all the time, why would God do that? Can you imagine the decision that had to be made at the most highest of order? And that when the, when, the, when the conclusion was come to, that there is only one way for sin to be paid for, and that is through the death of my son. I tell you, it was more than just death. Being made sin, that's the only way. So it says there's only one way, and that is I'm going to have to put my son to death. So why would he do that? Well, it just had to be love. You know, it wasn't because he had to do so. Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, he says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man. Will one die yet? Peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners. You know, Christ died for us when we were yet sinners. I've talked to many people over the years, and they still are under the impression that they must clean themselves up before God will save them. That's a, that, that's a treadmill you'll never get off of. I mean, because do you understand how good that you have to be? You have to be perfect. You can't work your way to perfect. It just isn't going to happen. But God, who was under no obligation, but what God was, God, God recognizing the... Uh, condition that man was in loved us enough to send Christ to die for the ungodly. That's, you know, most of the time you don't want to be in that crowd. But this is a good time to recognize our position and what Christ accomplished for us at Calvary. And we come along and we see. It says that at, uh, at, at we see that the gift of righteousness, that, that righteous is a gift. Romans chapter 5, verse 17 to 21 Romans chapter 5, verse 17. 
For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by one offense, one, uh, one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And we can do this because of, of course, it's going to be as the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, when we look at, uh, look at uh, the righteousness of God, where do you find the righteousness of God today? You know, you can't find him by looking up in the skies and, and following the zodiac. You can't look in by uh, worshiping trees and the rocks and the hills. All creations of God. We're going to find out that the only place to really find and be able to identify the righteousness of God is through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And after Christ paid the debt of sin, God was then free to clothe us with his righteousness. Now, when did that take place? Well, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13 says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Verse 27 of 1 Corinthians 12 identifies that that body is the body of Christ. It's Christ's body. And there, and you know, if you're, looking at the way the word structure may be, if you weren't really realizing how quick the transaction was made, in the moment, in the, in, a, in the instant that you believe, you know what? We were baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ. There wasn't something. You know, if you belong to a Baptist church at one point in time, it's every third Sunday or once a quarter we're going to have a baptismal ceremony. Well, not when you're getting into the body of Christ. Now when the Holy Spirit's in charge of this baptism, it is the moment that we believe the Holy Spirit takes and baptizes us into the body of Christ where we have been forgiven absolutely of all of our sins, all of our trespasses. And when the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ, we are immediately clothed with the absolute righteousness of God. You know, things are different in time past before Christ. And so we think about who or what or where was the righteousness of God manifest. In every age, there's been a place to find the righteousness of God. If we'll take a look in Romans chapter 3, and beginning in verse 19, and we'll go down to verse 22. Romans 3, verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. And then verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There was a place when you could find the absolute righteousness of God in time past, and it was in the law. The problem was the law was not man's remedy for justification unto eternal life. Man could be justified under the law, but not to eternal life. They could be judged and uh, they could be established as right when it came to obedience and uh, doing the things that God had said. But there was never a way. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in the sight of God, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. How would you like to be a part of the the denomination that doesn't believe that? That believes that you can find and be established as righteous unto God by keeping the law, by operating under a strict dietary code that comes out of the book of Leviticus. Or whatever it would be. But therefore, how much plainer can it be? Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. 
because the only thing that the law could do for by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's all it could do. But there was no remedy according to that. But, but we see, but what was it? Knowledge of sin, it showed the absolute righteousness of God compared to man's own humanity. But now, in verse 21, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. Well, what's the opposite of trying to keep the law? It's just believing. It's believing what God says and what God's going to do. It's an understanding, though, that, you know, because the law was there, it wasn't the means of justification to eternal life. But we look at it today and we see this. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There's a tremendous truth for us here and something that's probably the most important thing that we recognize in how God was able to do this through his son. What was it about the Lord Jesus Christ? The fact that he was sinless, of course, but it was a demonstration of his faithfulness. The faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, so quit looking at the law, quit looking at our self-righteousness, quit looking at mankind and say, you know, if we want to see what the absolute righteousness of God looks at to, like today, feast your eyes upon his son. Because that's where the righteousness of God is, and it's based on the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to Galatians chapter 2. Everything about our standing before God is connected to the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. Now, who's in this little conversation group? Well, Peter and Paul. And this is what Paul says to Peter in verse 16. He says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law there shall no flesh be justified. I still find it interesting that Paul says, Peter, you know this. Do you think Peter was unaware of the fact that therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight? I don't think, I don't think Peter had any question about that. He might not have understood what Paul is, had came on the scene and began to reveal about the finished work of Christ at Calvary. But Peter never thought that he could work his way to eternal life. He says, knowing, in verse 16 again, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Come to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Apostle Paul, boy, if he wanted to hang up his, uh, hum, hum, uh, his, his, uh, his uh, rewards or his, uh, his notoriety based on personal accolades, he had them to list out. He had quite the pedigree. But he come along, he could say this. He says in verse 7, What things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but dung, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. You know, I love that. And, and, uh, and Paul says, listen, there was a time when I had to come to a decision. And I had to set aside everything that I had accumulated in this life. He says, when I came to realize the difference between the righteousness which could come by the law, which is not done to eternal life, the righteousness came by the law. He says, you know what, I realized that the things I accomplished was nothing but dung. 
And I was willing to set all that aside. And that sounds easy for us perhaps today. But there are people today who just do not want to separate their good and leave it behind. They worked hard for it. You know, and they say, it's mine. I ought to be able to have it and to use it and to, and to uh, take advantage of it. Paul says, no, no. He says, I don't want to be found, verse 9. He says, and to be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. You know, here's a decision that believers need to make. That once we trust Christ as our Savior, there is nothing that we can do to perform that will enhance the righteousness which is of God by faith. We can't work our way to show favor with God. We can't uh, give more money or work more harder or share the gospel more or whatever. That has nothing to do with our standing before God. Our standing before God today is based on the relationship that the Lord Jesus Christ has with his Father. And now our standing before God is based on our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ who has a relationship with, the, with his Father, which is by faith. The faith of Jesus Christ. In the moment, the Holy Spirit took us and baptized us into his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, this was it. You can't improve on that. You can't go to a 10-week class and work your way to get any better at it because this is based on the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. No greater truth than that. Now, we look and we see how this goes today in the dispensation of grace. And what Paul was saying in, uh, in Ephesians and in Philippians and uh, in Galatians, what the Apostle Paul is talking about here, he says this is something new and unique to the dispensation of grace. And so somebody would say to us, you know, where did Paul learn this? You know, and Paul had a good teacher, and he listened to him. Come to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you, Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now, that's a mouthful when you start in, in, the, in the verse 1. And he says, you know, I received from the Lord Jesus Christ a message for you. And it's how that by revelation the Lord Jesus Christ made known unto me the mystery. Now, how do we know what the mystery is? You know, because we could say, you know, the whole Bible seems to be mysterious. But we come to this verse, he says, that he made known unto me the mystery. And how did he do it? How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. And how, was that, how did that take place? Well, Paul, the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to Paul from heaven. It was by revelation. That would be contrasted the way that he taught Peter and James and John and the other of his disciples as he taught them face to face as he was in their presence, and he taught them. But he says to Paul, he says, and Paul tells us, how that by revelation, verse 3, he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a fair, four and few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. People say, this is too hard to understand. Paul says, no, 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 it's not that hard to understand. If you will just read what I wrote, he says, you can understand and you can know what I know about the mystery. People will sometimes look and see, say, oh, you know, Paul had some sort of special ticket here. He got something special. But Paul says, listen, I received it by revelation, but the Lord Jesus Christ gave it to me so I could give it to you. And if you will just read and, under, and believe what it is that I wrote, and you can understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. He says in verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Come up in Acts chapter 3. You know, there are only, in the 66 books that we have in our Bible, 
there's only really two messages. One's prophecy and the other's mystery. And both of them concern the Lord Jesus Christ. What is it that separates them and makes them different? Acts chapter 3 and verse 18 to 21. It says, But those things which God before has showed by the mouth of all his holy prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Isn't it good to know that God's not going to have to send the Lord Jesus Christ back to finish something? He finished his part. He says to, to the nation of Israel, though, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive into the times of restitution of all things. Which all things is he talking about? Which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. You know what you can't find? You can't find Pauline revelation in the prophets. And so he comes and he speaks to the Apostle Paul. And come back to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. The mystery is not based on prophecy. The mystery is that unique revelation which was given to the Apostle Paul. That unique information given to the Apostle Paul. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, which in other ages was not made known. You know, that's going to present a little bit of a problem to Paul because the Apostle Paul doesn't have anywhere to go look this out. Look at verse 7 and 8. Wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of God. You know what Paul couldn't do? Couldn't go to Isaiah. Couldn't go to Jeremiah. Couldn't go to Ezekiel. Couldn't go to Daniel. Perhaps he went and tried. When he got through reading, he said, wow. You know, what I just learned from the risen and glorified Lord Jesus Christ, it's not there. It's the unsearchable riches of Christ. See, we have one up on the Apostle Paul today because we have the completed revelation. And we can go, and we know it's not unsearchable today. We can find it and with confidence read it and, uh, and believe it, if you will. So we come along and we see, and you know why that God had to keep a secret? You know, a secret is hard to keep. Do you have any trouble keeping a secret? If it's not any good, I don't have any trouble keeping it. <laughs> but a good secret, some secrets are just too hard to not tell somebody about. But God kept the secret. And this is, <laughs> yeah, it's a great secret. But God understood the consequences. He said that if I reveal even to one person <laughs> who will only tell one, who will only tell one, who will only tell one, if I tell that one person what I know I'm going to be doing in Christ at Calvary, then the one person that we don't want to know will find out. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, which none of the prince of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Well, God's plan of redemption, God's plan to remedy all that was wrong with us was based on his son going to Calvary. So he kept the secret. When the time was right, he revealed it to the Apostle Paul. He said, now, Paul, what I want you to do is I want you to go tell everybody about that. And so that's what Paul said. He says in Ephesians 3, verse 9, he says, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which at one time had been hid, but now is no longer hid. We come along, we see what the Apostle Paul is revealing to... Uh, to us today, and it's the, it's the message that was committed unto, unto him. You know, the Apostle Paul didn't have scriptures that he could go to. And the believers in Paul's day, they need, neither they, they, they didn't go look either. But it didn't mean that they were helpless. Come to Ephesians chapter 3, we're here, and we look at verse 5 again. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed, unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. You know what? Part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit was in time in, a, in the early ministry of the Apostle Paul. It was to confirm the message of the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. If any man think himself to be spiritual or a prophet, 
Let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the words of the Lord. Who confirmed it to that, to that, to that person? The Holy Spirit confirmed it. Here's a person, a believer, who, have, who believed what, uh, what Paul had said about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But his message is, is much more than that. And they weren't helpless. They had the ministry of the Holy Spirit to confirm that message. We come along, we see what God is doing today in the Apostle Paul, and he, we realize that the truth of the mystery has eternal consequences about where someone will spend eternity. And today we, we recognize that, come to Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. Romans 3, verse 23 and 24, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, somebody knew about this from the beginning of time. It just wasn't a man. In verse 25, it says, Whom God, speaking of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Did Adam have faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? No. Didn't know anything about it. It was still a secret that God was keeping close to the chest. What about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob? What about David? What about Peter, James, and John? He says, now listen. He says, pay attention. He says, this is critical. He says, being justified, verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood for the remission of sins that are past. <laughs> well, if nobody knew about that in time past, how could Christ be a propitiation? if you didn't know and you could not believe. But here we come along, we see that the one, who was the first person to have faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? No takers? God. It wasn't Paul. It was God, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. God in his sovereignty, knew what Christ was going to accomplish at Calvary. And he says, you know what I can do? What I am going to do? Knowing what I know about my son, the Lord Jesus Christ, I am going to hold him out to be an example. I am going to hold him out to be for all the world to know now because the truth of the mystery has been revealed. It is no longer a secret. And God says, speaking of Christ, he says, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. The sins that are past through the forbearance of God. How did God put up with that? How did God put up with animal sacrifices? How did God put up with this or that or the depravity of man? Because he knew that there was a day coming when all of this would be put into perspective by the faith and the faithfulness of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the quality of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God holds that out for the sins that are past. Now, I've heard this passage taught, and it scared me because I understood that I got through listening to that. Those are the sins that I committed before I trusted Christ as my Savior. But the good news of Christ at Calvary is he paid for all sin, past, present, and future. So if it didn't mean those sins, then what could it possibly have meant? And what it could have possibly and only have meant was that he, uh, the sins that are past, all the sins of the time past of the old covenant. So he says, well, what about after, after that? He says in verse 26, he says to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, we're still talking about the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But now when it says that he, that's God, might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. You know, the gospel of the day and the dispensation of grace is all about a message that we can believe. 
So the question about where you will spend the eternity, will you spend eternity being cast alive into the lake of fire because you failed to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? You know, there's only two groups of people are going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ out there in eternity. One group is going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at what is called the great white throne of judgment. And they're going to be evaluated on their works. And when we come to being evaluated by their works, you know, there's going to be some silly person there saying, now that I know what the standard is, <laughs> I'm going to be okay. After all, I have done something tremendously wonderful in this. And what it is that I'm going to do, because I've done some pretty good things. And so they're going to stand before God thinking that this is okay. They're going to pass this test of flying colors because of all the things that they did. And they're going to, they'll have the opportunity to plead their case. And they're going to be judged according to their works because the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is not available to them. And they're going to say, Lord Jesus, didn't you know I did this? I worked harder than anybody else. I gave, I did, I served. I prayed, I did all these things. You know, there won't even be anybody the judgment, at the great white throne of judgment who's going to get up there and brag about their sin. But they're going to brag about their good works. And Jesus will say to them, just as he said to the Pharisees in the, in the gospel accounts, have you not read? Have you not read that there is none righteous, no, not one? Have you not read that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? Have you not read that, that the, the penalty for that is to be cast alive in the lake of fire? When they get through that, that, that exam there, they'll be cast into the lake of fire. The other group of people will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at the great, at the uh, judgment seat of Christ. And things are going to be so much different there. You know, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Some people take a look at that and they say, man, we have got to be absolutely afraid of God, afraid of the Lord Jesus Christ when we stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ. And I say to you that the, the difference between the great white throne and the judgment seat of Christ is so vastly different, there is no similarity. Those at the great white throne, therefore knowing the terror of the Lord, that's why we persuade men. Because 2 Corinthians 5, 14 says, for the love of Christ constraineth us. So what is it, terror or is it the love of Christ? But we do know about the terror of the Lord. That's what Revelation 20 is about. And we persuade men. We pray you in Christ's stead. Be reconciled to God. The issue at the judgment seat of Christ is not to be intimidated by the fear of God. I don't care what denomination you grew up in. It's not a fearful time. It's not when God is going to chastise and judge you and torment you based on the bad choices that we made. You know, when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ, there's only going to be two people present in the room. One is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ, and the other is going to be the new creature that was created in Christ Jesus and is created in Christ Jesus according to the design of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad my old man will never make that trip <laughs> because he could cast a lot of spurious doubt. So God says, oh, no, no. He didn't make the trip. He's dead. And so the issue, that's right. So we're standing there before the Lord Jesus Christ to find out what sort of work we've done. What sort of service have we done? Once again, the Apostle Paul says this. He says in, second, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, it's based on the grace of God given, given to me as a wise master builder. So we've got gold, silver, precious stone. We have wood, hay, and stubble. And the fire is going to try every work of what sort that it is. Is it gold, silver, precious stone, or is it wood, hay, and stubble? You know what makes the difference? Everything that we did in service for the Lord that was done in agreement to the doctrines that were given to the Apostle Paul, that's gold, silver, and precious stone. Wood, hay, and stubble is everything else. Everything that we did that wasn't in agreement with the doctrines that were given to Paul as a wise master builder, you know what? The Lord Jesus Christ just cannot. 
He cannot reward us for that. So it's going to be tried by fire. And it's going to be burned up. There will be some people, the possibility, that there will be some who will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ with every work they have burned up. But you know what the good news is? Yet they shall be saved, even so as by fire. Because perhaps the only thing they ever did that was in agreement with Pauline doctrine was they trusted Christ as their Savior. The question would be, have you? You know, it's not have you thought so or wonder about it. You know, and God knows whether you have or not. But the real thing is, do you believe what God believes about His Son? As we read that God holds His Son out to be a propitiation. Today we know what it takes to no longer come into the come short unto the other glory of God. It is just simply by faith, believing that Christ died for our sins. It's a message. The mystery has a message for us to believe. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your grace. We thank you for the provisions of Christ in Calvary. We pray that our lives will be exemplary of the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that what Christ accomplished for us at Calvary is available to us for eternity. We give you the praise and honor and glory for that. In Jesus' name we pray.